for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, or sighings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, we live in a beautiful world, don't we? This is a wonderful place to live. And if we have the opportunity to go on holiday and things like that, there's stunning scenery, isn't there? Marvellous views, amazing. Amazing plants, amazing flowers, incredible numbers of fish and animals and birds that God has created, including an extraordinary diversity of human, to human beings populating this planet. And having populated this planet, they fashioned Earth's resources into clothes like the we're wearing, breathtaking buildings, towns, cities, and extraordinary means of transport. It truly is a remarkable world, isn't it? Yes? Yet alongside this, People up in Yorkshire will be bemoaning the fact that they've had terrible floods. Destruction caused by hurricanes and other weather events that cause destruction. Wildfires like we've seen down in Australia and many other places. Death and decay all around us, all the time. And we look out here, and we look at the lovely vistas of trees turning golden. I mean, it looks beautiful. But what is it? It's death, isn't it? They're dying. They say, why, they go golden, they go red. And then, deadly creatures. Insects, things that can kill us. The constant inhumanity of man towards man with <coughs> conflicts and wars. Horrific events reported in the news almost every day. I don't know some of you have seen the uh, advert uh, which quotes Charles Dickens' famous famous lines from this tale of two cities. It was the season 
And elsewhere he, wrote, he writes, the sea did what it liked. And what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town. It thundered at the cliffs. It brought the coast down madly. And this is how things are in this current world, aren't they? This is the world we live in. And we have an explanation in the Bible as to why things are like this. After God created the world in all its primal beauty, something happened that changed everything. We call that the fall. As a consequence of man, of humankind's disobedience, rejection of God, God was obliged to judge humanity and he cursed this earth and he delivered it over into the hands of the evil one, Satan. That's, where, that's what this world is all about. Yet, in the light of eternity, this short, corrupted period of human history is nothing. And human history is heading towards an end that is both glorious but is also terrible and terrifying. It amuses me. Conservationists today are very concerned about global warming. Um, it, it is, that is something to be concerned about. Yet they have no comprehension at all of the global incineration that is going to come upon this earth when Jesus comes back. He promised that whole earth would be burned with fire. And this is something every human being needs to be even more concerned than the global warming that we see now. God is going to bring this damaged world to a fiery end out of which he will bring about his original plan. And his original plan was not what we see now. Nothing like it. His plan was there would be a new heaven and a new earth free from any kind of evil, any sin, any selfishness, any hatred, any sadness, any disease, any death. And on this new earth, we are going to live in resurrection bodies in God's immediate presence forever. And how amazing that's going to be, isn't it? Can you imagine the horror of living forever on this earth as it is now, it's unthinkable, isn't it? We're all going to die. Praise God that we're all going to die. No, it all has to become new. It's all got to have to be redeemed. Everything's got to be perfected. And this is what Paul calls in this passage the glory. That is to be revealed to us. Whoa. And in the passage, Paul also describes how creation itself is eagerly longing for this day to come. All that we see in this world is an expression of futility. Not because there's anything wrong with creation per se, but God had to subject it to what Paul calls bondage of corruption to corruption. And that's what we see all around us. How many of you have seen, uh, well, I won't say I'll show of hands, but Sir David Zatterbury 
latest series of films. Amazing. Here we see extraordinary cuteness and horrible violence hand by hand, side by side. Do you really think that that's how God originally intended things to be? How God designed this world? No way. Or is this the result of God subjecting this world to a bondage to corruption? Yeah, that's what it is. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That's how Paul describes it. And he uses this graphic phrase of childbirth because when Adam and Eve began to have children after the fall, God made it such that human childbirth would be intensely painful as an illustration of the seriousness of how human independence and selfishness had impacted God's in creation. Many of you have been through that. When I was at uni many, many years ago, I learned about a principle of corruption to which God subjected this creation. And some of you will have come across the idea of entropy. Entropy. Everything tends to increase disorder and decay. And that the remarkable principle that overcomes entropy to some extent is the principle of life. In life, things are ordered. Where there's life, things continue. Amazing how little babies are born, little children come into this world. The opposite of disorder. And God puts those amazing little bodies together in the womb and then they become us. But of course, even life is limited in this world. Entropy always wins. Every living thing ultimately ages, decays and dies. And creation is groaning for an end of this principle of corruption longing for the day when it will be set free from such bondage and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Can we imagine a world in which nothing decays? Can you imagine a time when we won't need fridges? Flowers never wilt and die. Nothing goes mouldy. There will never be used by dates because everything keeps perfectly everything lasts forever and if we're going to live forever in new resurrection bodies God is going to have to bring entropy and decay and corruption to an end <clears throat> and this has such far reaching consequences that we cannot imagine a world that is so far different from the one that we are now so fully immersed in. Crete, cute creatures that are free from any kind of violence. The lion, as it says in the Old Testament, laying down with the lamb. Children playing with what previously were deadly snakes. Not that there will be any children anyway. Because human reproduction will have come to an end. There will be no children in the new heaven and the earth. The only purpose for this brief current world in which we live is that humankind will be fruitful and multiply so that we might populate eternity. so that we might live forever in a loving relationship with God. But of course the huge challenge to all who live in this world is this vitally important question, will our children populate the new earth 
or will they populate hell? There's only one of two options. And the only way that we can populate the new earth is if the message of the gospel is received and believed. It's the only way that those born into this decaying world will be saved from eternal death and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we hold our little babies in our hands. Our desperate prayer is God. Bring them to yourself. Bring them to Christ. Because the only alternative is unthinkable. But it's real. Jesus had to be born into the excruciating corrupt world. And he had to die an excruciating death on the cross in order that some of this world's human population might be forgiven their sin, might be delivered from their independence of God, and by Jesus rising from the dead, could be born again and become children of God, could become a new creation in order to ultimately share and experience eternal glory. You see, this is where everything is heading. Everything is heading to the new heaven, the new earth. And as I said, this is both wonderful and is also terrifying. My question to you is, do you know where you're heading at the end of your life on this earth? You may have a, a long life. You may have a very short life. But I guarantee you, you're going to die sometime. And where are you going to go? What's going to happen to you then? Most people think, that's it. This is the end of it. No. It's just the beginning. We make our plans on this earth. Plans about education and plans to go to university. Wow. Study. And then we come out on the other end and think, now what am I going to do with my life? Eh? Have you made sensible plans for eternity? That's a big question. Have you made sensible plans? Are you making sensible plans? For eternity. Because this life comes so quickly to its end. What about forever? What are your plans for forever? Eh? And as we see, Jesus came. He died on the cross. So that we could be forgiven our sins. He rose again so that we could give a new life so that we could share forever with him. But only if you lay hold of it, only if you believe in it. Do you believe? Have you made a commitment to Christ? Have you said, yes, I'll follow you, Lord? Because that's what it's all about. Shall we just bow our heads for a moment? Do you know where you're going? Have you made sensible plans to be with Christ forever in the new heaven, the new earth? And you can, if you've never done that, you can do that right now. You can say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my independence, my selfishness, my living for myself. You're saying the words were the whole realm of nature, mine, 
that's an offering far too small would for this it demands my life my all and if you haven't done that already I guess most of us have done just say Lord I give you my life my all because that's the only way I can guarantee forever Forgive me for my selfishness. Come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising again to give me new life. Amen. Now Paul at the beginning of our passage speaks about suffering. And uh, none of us are free from suffering in this world, are we? Every one of us faces some sort of suffering at some sort of time. Nobody sails through life without any difficulties. But what Paul has in mind here is not just the general suffering of being a part of this world. He has... The, the suffering of being a follower of Christ. And we fortunately live in a country where we're free to come and worship like this. If you were in church in, on Easter in Sri Lanka, you might have been blown up. That doesn't happen here. The most is something like this street preacher who got arrested, falsely arrested, set free afterwards if we choose to live a godly life in the midst of this oh so ungodly world we may well find opposition hatred we might even be marginalized we might even find ourselves persecuted in one way or another for many people the bible is a book full of hate speech we live in a 21st century tolerance society but the one thing people won't tolerate is the Bible goodness me the things that it says and please let us not try and protect ourselves from this we can easily do that by holding back from sharing the gospel with people who so desperately need it It doesn't mean we have to go and stand outside tube stations and preach the gospel. It happens in our daily lives. There are all sorts of situations and people we bump into and neighbours we talk to and opportunities to speak about Jesus, what he's done. Where, they, where they're going to go. What do we feel in our hearts about our friends, our neighbours? You have this option. It's either to be with God forever or it's hell. So. Let's keep in mind the amazing hope we have both in this life and beyond it. This will radically change our perspective so that as Paul writes, and consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We've got a guaranteed future glory that trumps any suffering that we might face in this life, haven't we? And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now Paul describes here being filled with the Holy Spirit as the first fruits of the Spirit. 
Interesting word. Let's have a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, where Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we'd be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. He's given us the Spirit as a guarantee, a first fruit, a down payment. So life in this world is like camping in a tent, right? And when Jesus comes again at the end of this world, we're going to be moving into our permanent dwelling. And the gift of the Spirit is a down payment, a guarantee the first fruits of what that's going to be like. Being filled with spirit here in this world is a foretaste of eternity, of the new heaven, the new earth. And while we wait for that to come, he says we groan inwardly as we await our adoption as sons. Now, last week, Tony explained, uh, as she took the previous verses in Romans 8, that adoption has to do with inheritance. And while we are already regenerated children of God, we don't get our full inheritance until Jesus comes back, okay? And we'll get our resurrection bodies. Wow. And while we have the spirit of adoption now, the Spirit who fills us, and that gives us full assurance that we are God's beloved children. Do you know that? A total, indubitable sense. I am absolutely 100% a child of God. A wonderful experience. But our full adoption will not happen until Jesus comes back. When we become heirs, we enter into our inheritance. Everything is on tender hooks, eagerly longing for the end of this world, for the inauguration of this new creation. And this is our hope. And in this hope, he says, we are saved. Paul then explains that hope is something future that we cannot see. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. The Bible idea of hope is much more robust than our English version. I hope so. No. Hope is, I know so. I don't see it yet, but I know so. It's an absolute certain conviction that Jesus is going to return again in the future and bring this world to its ultimate end. And so, brothers and sisters, let's take by faith hold of our day down payment that we have received in this new earth, which is the first fruits of the Spirit, and make sure that we go on being filled with the Spirit on a daily basis. Continually. That's really important. This will help us from being captivated by this fading world. And keep our hope of a new creation alive. It was interesting. One of the prayers that early Christians prayed regularly when they got together was... Come, Lord Jesus. 
Wow. Is that what we pray? Come, Jesus, come back. Return, end this world. Come and bring your kingdom. Let's be free from this corrupt, rotten, decaying world in which we live. With all its beauty, with all its beautiful things, but it, this is not what God intended. This earth. And then at the end of the passage we're looking at today, Paul adds a very insightful comment on prayer. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now I think I will, would agree with me, I hope, that we are all rubbish at praying, yes? Anybody who's not rubbish at praying? One of the reasons that God has chosen to give us his Holy Spirit to come and live inside us and pour out his Spirit on us is so that we might be helped in our weakness when we pray. We don't know how to pray. We can't pray. We're rubbish. We're weak. We may try and pray, but... And he uses a very interesting, unique word here. The Holy Spirit hyper-intercedes. That's a sort of two-bit word. Which basically means that the Holy Spirit does the praying for us and through us because we are so weak and we don't know how to pray for ourselves. That's great, isn't it? To have the Holy Spirit do our praying for us, through us, so the words come out of our mouths, we do the praying, but it's the Holy Spirit who's praying through us. Hyper intercedes. And when we stop trying to pray in our own strength, with our own in insights, And when we let the Holy Spirit do the praying in us and through us, we are helped out of our weakness and we find ourselves doing something that we don't know how to do. That's great, isn't it? And sometimes when we do open ourselves up uh, to the Holy Spirit and pray by faith, we can be surprised by words that are coming out of our mouths. Amazing, isn't it? You think, why? Wow. I've often found myself praying for somebody, and then you know, you lay hands on them and you start praying for them, and suddenly you think all these strange things, you think, where did that all come from? Well, it came from him. Sometimes it's not even words. It's sighs or groanings too deep for words there are times when I've never been praying and I'm just oh and then it's not only that sometimes the words come out of our mouths in languages that we never learned this is what happened to the disciples on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on them, and Luke describes it in these words, and they all began to speak in other languages, that's languages they didn't know, as the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. Now going back many years, when I was at uni, I was desperate to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This all sounded a bit weird, a bit strange. 
Why would I need to pray in a language I couldn't understand? Sure. Here's this intellectual know-it-all guy at university, 21 years old or something, maybe 18, 19. So my prayer was, no thanks, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, but you can keep the foreign languages. Uh, I don't want us. You can keep that. And immediately, a voice came into my head. This is what I do. And if you, were, if you want me, I come with foreign languages. Uh, if you want me, I come with foreign languages. So I had to swallow my arrogant intellectual pride and to capitulate. So like Jesus' disciples, I asked the Lord to fill me with his Holy Spirit. Some people were praying for me. I began to speak out words that were beginning to form in my mouth and it all sounded like a load of gobbledygook. But the words kept coming. And I found myself praying in the Spirit with a fresh sense of passion and urgency that I've never known before. Only the Lord knows what I was praying, but it was clearly according to the will of God. That's what he says here, isn't it? You pray in the Spirit, it's according to the will of God. And that's what really mattered, not that I could understand it. It didn't matter that I couldn't understand it, as long as what I was praying was according to the will of God. Now, I've been praying like this for almost 50 years. And often in the morning, I wake up praying words that I don't know. It's like the, my spirit has been chatting away with the Holy Spirit all night, and now I've woken up. Elsewhere, Paul tells us, Always pray in the Spirit. This is a deliberate, voluntary choice we make to get down to pray, particularly with others. Always do it in the Spirit. Do we pray what we want to pray about, or think we ought to pray, or do we just turn ourselves over to the Holy Spirit and let him give us words to pray through us? either in our native language or in our unknown tongue, language or in signs and groans. doesn't really matter, does it? Holy Spirit praying through us. And when we do, do this, we know that whatever we pray, whatever the words that come out of our mouths are in accordance with the will of God. That's the important thing, isn't it? Now, it might sound a bit weird. If you've never experienced it personally, praying in the Spirit, I tell you, it's not in any way weird. It's very down to earth, very basic, very matter of fact. You just choose to do it. And praying in a language given by the Spirit actually allows our spirits to pray in cooperation with the Holy Spirit more than is possible in our native language, English or otherwise. It's actually a wonderful gift of God, enabling us to pray and speak to Him without the constraints of having to think up words and phrases with our minds. Our minds are still active, of course. Paul describes our minds as being unfruitful in 1 Corinthians 14. That means that the Holy Spirit's come praying through us, through our tongue, through our mouth, but our mind is sort of can be anywhere you like. You can be thinking about anything else, thinking about dinner, thinking about what you're going to do after the meeting's over, or what, what you know. 
it is, we just have to be aware of wandering thoughts when they're playing in another language. We just have to focus ourselves on Christ, on the Lord. I once prayed for a young man who said, I started to pray in tongues and then all these filthy thoughts came into my mind. I said, oh, that was fine. That's the, the devil with a bucket of filth just come along. You, there you are, talking away in unknown languages. Your mind's empty, so he just tips a bottle of, b bucket of filth in. Forget it. You think about Jesus and pray in a different language. And he came back the next day. Oh, wonderful. I've been praying in these other, um, these other languages and thinking about Jesus. No more dirty thoughts. It's great, yeah? We have to bring our mind into... This is unfruitful. You have to bring it into, into line. So, <coughs> we're going to sing a final song. And uh, then I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to move amongst us as we're standing. We'll wait for a while. I know it's getting towards 12 o'clock, but we're not in a rush. Let's open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. And then I want us all to pray out loud whatever comes to our mind. Try it all together. You could use your native language, English or whatever it is. Or you might just find the Spirit gives you just a deep sense of sighing. Or you may get words that mean nothing to you. But just keep praying out. Maybe switch from English to another language or to groans. And we'll have a go at all of this. Eh? And we'll spend some time praying like this. And, and if you suddenly find, why, it's some very interesting thoughts. Things I'm praying I've never thought of before. You might like to write them down to reflect on afterwards. So, free from this corrupt world, we're all going to die, but we're free to pray and um, let's sing our last songs.